Our house is made out of two 40 foot high cube shipping containers. We're entirely off grid with no town power or piped water. We're located on top of a mountain in the Australian bush. We used to live in Scotland. I had an unexpected job offer to come to Australia and I like adventures. I was actually quite happy living in Scotland, the northeast of Scotland. We had a very idyllic life. And then one day Paul came home and said, what do you think of Australia? And I said, oh, that would be a good place for a holiday. Yeah, sounds good. He said, no, not a holiday. How do you feel about living there? So our whole life changed and we ended up in Australia, living in suburbia. The utility bills of running a four-bedroomed house with a swimming pool in Australia meant that we really had no money at all left over to have any fun. I just hated it. I didn't want to stay in suburbia. I wanted to get out. And I wanted to create something that didn't have utility bills. What made me think I could live off-grid in a shipping container? I knew that people did live off-grid and I had no idea how they did it. pick shipping containers because we don't have any land and it's really that simple. If you've got a block of land you can build a house but if you don't have a block of land then you really need to build your house that you can put on the land that you find one day maybe. <laughs> so that's why shipping containers were a good option and that's also the reason that I haven't put anything on the outside that I can't remove they can one day be picked up if required and they could be moved again. Trying to find suitable land is really quite challenging. We were very lucky. We found somebody that wanted to help us achieve our goal. They had a lot of land and they gave us space in the corner to just go and play. And in return, I do jobs that are required just to help out. Part of the arrangement was that we actually enhanced the land, so we ended up upgrading the roads and putting in infrastructure that wasn't there before. So it's been a mutually beneficial arrangement. We got a third container. This is to store the furniture from our suburban lifestyle in and for me to use as a workshop. I've never built a house before. <laughs> I've never built a house before and I've definitely never built a shipping container house before. I just started. I put black tape where I don't want to cut until the very end. I used large and small grinders to cut the hole. I'd watched my dad build a house with no formal training very successfully. What he did was he did research to find out how it was meant to be done and then he did that. And that's the principle that I've brought to this project is I look at how industry does something and then I replicate or duplicate it in a way that works for me. The reason that I like these ceiling rails is it lets me put up my light fittings very early on in the project. 
I can get in some insulation to prevent the heat from the roof from coming down. And it's very easy to work with the ceiling lights. So they just slide forwards and backwards and I can put them anywhere I like. There are three things about me that have come into play. I'm an engineer, I'm a teacher and I like adventures. So this whole expedition has been a complete adventure. Is that done? Ooh. <laughs> Hello door. It's just a bit stuck at the top there, look. I've had no formal building training, but I was brought up in a house where my dad rebuilt everything from scratch with no formal training. Hello door. And I came to believe that anyone can do anything that they put their mind to. I had to learn a lot of new skills. For example, I couldn't weld. When I needed welding doing, I went to see a friend and said, would he weld two pieces of metal together? And he said, no, but I'll teach you how to do it. I now really enjoy welding. It takes practice, but it, everything is learnable and you get better when you practice. I didn't start with a fixed design. I started with a concept. And what I've done is I've altered the shape or the design or the windows to suit each of our requirements. So we add a window when we need to see more light or ventilation um, or a door for more access. One of the things I learned was that even when you think you've thought it through completely, not all of your ideas are good. I've made changes and I've made changes on changes and first, second and third ideas have gone on to be refined. The first ceiling design had a few flaws. It was plywood suspended over a steel and aluminium frame. It would bow and sag in the middle, which wasn't very pretty. I had a rethink and I made a new prototype. I put in sound and thermal insulation patterns and then I wired up the lights. This was made in a modular way so that I could make them on my own and just put them into place when I got assistance. Putting the panel in was probably the hardest part of the entire project up to now. Ah, you. One, yeah. So I'm putting in a sliding door so that we retain the space either on the inside or the outside. Now I've just roughed it in so it's just a header holding this in place and I've got to the point where the door is actually functioning. It's now sliding, I've yet to put the handle on. I've covered the outside on both sides in builder's paper and I think that will give me a level of insulation. We now have a front door. It's a big improvement. I'm now ready to enclose the walkway between the containers. I want to preserve the natural light and I also want plenty of ventilation. I'm going to experiment using a fly screen as a wall. Probably the hardest bit is living in what you're building is way harder than building something and then moving in. There was a TV show came up in the last couple of years and everybody that I know told me about it so I tuned in and watched it. It was a reality show where contestants were going to build a shipping container house in a day 
and I was just incredulous thinking how were they going to pull this one off because I'd been at it for two and a half years <laughs> it turns out they were just decorating a Wendy house and they never actually lived in it so they never got to find out just how bad their design was <laughs> they'd have froze and they'd have been miserable <laughs> There's as much effort goes into building a shipping container house as there is a real house because you need real insulation, you need to make it warm, you need flowing water, you need power points. It's a real house. It's very easy to look at the videos where I just crane in the containers and go tra-la. But I've been doing this on my own for two and a half years. <laughs> I haven't had a team of builders where I just say here's an unlimited budget and just finish it. I save up and I buy the materials when I can afford it and then I do what I can and that's the reason that this project's taken so long. I also work full time so with having to commute from the house to work and then come back there's only a limited amount of time for me to actually do the building and that's really slowed things down really quite considerably this floor is actually really quite easy to lay the only challenge is trying to get it laid under the furniture when I've already got it in place. It's not as easy as a house in a day. The clipped together lino tiles have been a great success. The tiles are going in the first half of the container. This is because I come in with muddy boots when I'm filling up the firewood pile. Containers have some parts of the floor that are made out of steel. There are small height transitions where it changes from wood to steel. When I put the floor down in the kitchen, I was concerned that these would show. This hasn't been the case, and I'm happy to extend this flooring into the sitting room. I need to reduce the height on the bottom of the door. This will enable a door to open freely and not snag on the wooden trim or the new floor. Lots of the costs associated building with the container house are very similar to a regular house. This is because they both need the same windows and insulation. I've used recycled materials wherever I can in this project. You achieve savings if you're able to do the work yourself or you're able to use recycled materials instead of new. I estimate this project has cost about 80,000 Australian or 61,000 US. I've plumbed in the shower breach to the hot and cold lines. Containers can sweat, so I've lined the framing with sarking. When I say it took two years to get a shower to the top of the most important list, that's actually true. There were other things that were more important because we had to have roof space to collect the water, store the water, and then the infrastructure to build the shower. So I, it did truly take two years to prioritize the shower to the top of the pile. How long will it take? If you'd asked me at the start of the project, I'd have said six months. My sister came to visit me and she said, this is going to take you three years. I'm currently at three and a half years. <laughs> if I was to go through this all again, I think I would probably have people helping. 
think it was very stressful trying to do everything on our own and it took longer to do just on our own. Whereas if we'd had more people helping, I think we could have probably done it quicker. There's plenty of space in our shipping containers, two shipping containers for two people. I think you could probably even have one child in two shipping containers, but no more. And although it's long and thin, there's definitely enough space. And you get used to it. You get used to living in a smaller, compact space. Each of the containers is 28 square metres. This gives us space comparable with a one bedroom apartment in a major city. I like the fact that it's all compact. I like the fact that I can walk very easily through to the kitchen. Oh, this is very nice. And our little living area is small, okay, we've got two chairs in it. We can sit and watch a film at night or sit and watch the fire burning in the winter. I see people who live in houses the size of shopping malls and big chunks of their wages are going just to keep the place cool or warm. Having done that, I'd much rather keep the money in my pocket for something a little more enjoyable. we don't have connection to town power. It was actually much easier to go off grid than I thought. We bought a decent generator and that gave us the power for the first six months. It took time to install the solar panels and to get the wiring and to have the, so have the sun produce it, but it's actually really very simple. we have 12 250 watt panels. The panels are at the perfect angle to collect the most sun in winter. The collected energy is stored in two battery banks. These are T105 batteries and they're normally used in golf carts. I was told that the wet lead acid batteries last longer and give better performance than the sealed batteries, which means I have to do regular maintenance. This however is very simple and all I have to do is top up the fluid levels. We monitor the batteries and the solar panels using this little unit on the wall called a mate. It's just a simple display unit and it shows what state the batteries and the solar panels are in. We run a regular fridge freezer and we also have a small chest freezer which reduces our reliance on going shopping regularly. I chose not to buy expensive off-grid appliances such as 12 volt fridges and freezers. We bought our regular white goods from the house and have enough electricity to run them. The washing machine receives hot and cold water. The hot comes from the instant gas hot water system. We have all the appliances that every household has. The only difference is that we use our electricity during the day when it's being created rather than at night when it's not. At the beginning of the project I used to monitor the power off the panels and the energy in the batteries obsessively. We now have enough power and enough batteries for the system to take care of itself. If we get a few days of rain I monitor them more carefully but it's very rare that we have to fire up the generator for a top up. The Australian sunshine produces some very high temperatures. On a sunny day the batteries are full by 11 in the morning. This leaves the remaining sunshine to power the air conditioner. 
the air conditioner is only used very occasionally. We do use fans on the warm days though. Our preferred cooling method is ventilation by opening the windows and the cargo doors. We have a couple of 12 volt car outlets which lets us charge phones. The 12 volts also powers the modem for the internet. The modem that connects to the internet is inside the container where the signal is very weak. To solve this we put an external aerial on the roof. This is a directional antenna and we get a much stronger signal. Lighting and high speed broadband internet connection is on its own system. I have a separate panel that connects to a 12 volt truck battery. This battery lives in a box in the walkway and it has a dedicated charger although it's very rare for the charger to be used. I experimented with lots of different types of LED and the only ones that I'll install are the ones that give a warm light because they're a much nicer environment. When I designed the lights the intention was to be able to read a book or a newspaper in any part of any of the containers with sufficient light. However, there's no point in lighting the entire container if you're only working in one small area. I installed pull cord light switches which lets us light any part of the container but to switch it off when we're not using it. The sun provides our electrical energy. It's that simple. We have to use it when the sun's shining and not at night, but it's just easy. It's ridiculously easy. Somewhere between 11 in the morning and one in the afternoon, the batteries will become full. So it's a nice day in winter and it's 11 o'clock and we've got full batteries. With full batteries we can use as much electricity as we like. We have a few appliances that are always connected to the mains electricity. The everyday fridge freezer, the chest freezer we use for storage, the water pump for the sinks and the shower. We'll normally have about three computers switched on during the day. By 4 o'clock in the afternoon the sun's dipped behind the trees. At this point we stop using the non-essential items so we're not draining the batteries. By about 6 in the evening all we're generally using is the computers. We've now arrived at the point where we just don't have to worry about electricity. In the early phases of the project I was forever looking at the volts and the amps and seeing how much we had to go. Now I check it at bedtime and I don't always even do that. I like not having electricity bills. It's brilliant. The feeling about being off grid is absolutely amazing. We have the local areas having power cuts and we don't. We've always got power. It's absolutely fantastic to be able to use all my appliances when the sun's shining. We really don't go without anything that a four bedroom house doesn't go without. The sunroof's been critical in the design of our house. It performs two functions. Primarily it keeps the sun off the roof and protects us from the radiant heat. Of equal importance, the sunroof harvests the water from the rain. This gives us our water supply. We collect our water in three different places and this has evolved over time. The bulk of the water is collected on the main sunroof which I've gradually extended. Gutters and pipes from the sunroof direct water to the main house tank. The sunroof doesn't give us enough water catchment, so I built the woodshed. Its primary task was to be roof space to catch more water, but as a bonus it keeps our firewood dry. 
Again, that still wasn't enough water catchment, so I added gutters to the underside of the kitchen. This seems to have done the trick. Catching water is only half the battle. You need enough space to store it. Our water storage has slowly expanded to meet our needs. We're now sustainable with water. Our water pressure comes from a very modest Davy water pump. It has analog switches which allows it to run successfully with the generator if needed. It draws its power from the 240 volts. We clean the water by putting it through a 20 micron paper cartridge filter. Our water is fine for washing and showering, but the water that we drink goes through an extra level of filtration. We have two ceramic water filters which filter down to 0.5 microns. This removes all the germs and the pathogens and it also removes heavy metals. Our drinking water tastes a lot nicer than town water. About a year in, we'd run out of water and we had some water delivered from a water truck and I didn't even know they existed. And the chap said, is this your first water delivery? And I said, yes. And he says, well, you're not going to like it then. And I said, why? And he wouldn't tell me. When he turned the pumps on and filled the tank, and I put my head in the top, it absolutely stinks. <laughs> All you can taste and smell is chlorine. Town water is foul. <laughs> it really is. After you've lived with natural water from the rain, it's just so much nicer. This is the roof that collects the water for the Duck Hotel. It fills the blue barrel and the overflow runs down the hill into a second blue barrel. The blue barrels give me a fairly constant supply of water for the Duck's water troughs. Early in the project we had little or no water. For washing we had to buy a twin tub which uses considerably less water than an automatic. This was a shame because we had a beautiful automatic sat next to it. We appreciated it in the beginning, but we were pleased when we got enough water to run the regular automatic. This is its maiden wash with its own hot and cold supply. Although we have a lovely shower, I missed having a bath. So I built a solar powered outdoor bathtub. In winter we can't generate enough hot water from solar panels to fill the bath. Summer's arrived and it's time to resurrect the outdoor bath. This solar panel heats the water in the black barrel and it does it by creating a thermosiphon. Here's how it works. I fill up my barrel with cold water. The water starts at about 20 to 22 degrees. It's gravity fed from the silver tank further up the hill. I have to fill it higher than the water pipe from the solar panel. It comes through the right angle bend into the bottom of the solar panel, rises up the panel and comes out the hot side at the top. From there it flows into the top of the water barrel, but below the level of the water. This flow is called thermosiphon and it occurs naturally. I don't pump anything. The output feed to supply the bath is slightly above the cold outlet pipe. I open two valves and it'll feed directly into the bath. At four o'clock in the afternoon, I measure 52 degrees C on the water. I saw temperatures of 70 degrees on the manifold in full sun. That's hot, 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 hot. Hot to about there. Very hot. Hot water, cold water. Sometimes you just have to top up with cold. Ow, that's hot water. You come to say hello? Hello. 
You just think there's bugs, don't you? Well, there's plenty of bloody bugs. Yeah. Not the sort you want, though. Cheers. Cheers. When bath time's over, I have to refill the tank. And that's it full till next Sunday. After I've had my bath, I leave the plug in and the following day I have a bath of cold water. When I feel the water is past its best, I simply use it to water the garden and whatever's left over goes into the centre of the banana circle. The conventional townhouse uses town water and town sewage and we don't have either of those things. More rural properties have mains water and they run the sewage into a septic tank but that needs quite a bit of infrastructure and that's not practical for us. The beauty of a composting toilet is you don't need to have a constant running water supply. After the toilet's been used you simply add a scoop of organic peat mix and sawdust or wood chips. We use a mix of peat and sawdust in the composting loo. I pre-mix this in a box outside. When you turn the handle it spins the drum which moves what you've just put in the toilet move to the back into the composting part of the chamber. This will quietly compost and reduce down to a much smaller volume. After a few months of composting, you turn the handle in the opposite direction and it takes the small processed soil and it puts it into the finishing tray where it sits for another month or two and then it gets taken outside and buried and put in the garden. After a year of living with it, we didn't like it and we've moved on. We do like the double bucket loop. It's really easy to keep clean and you empty it like a waste paper basket. We put everything from the toilet into composting bells. We add our kitchen waste and we keep them warm and damp. We fill it until it's full and then we leave it for nature to take care of it. After about six months, the volume's reduced to about a third. This creates amazing soil and this can be used to put round trees. Each location that we've put the composting bells, nature finds it and takes advantage. A tomato plant found it this time, and now we've got loads of small cherry tomatoes growing. Our early attempts to grow food in full Australian sun weren't very successful. We didn't have enough water, the sun fried everything, and what did grow was eaten by the wildlife. I've built a large cage where we can grow our own vegetables. The veg cage is just a few steps down from the kitchen door. I just use simple taps to restrict and control the water where I need it. It's watered automatically with the water in the kitchen sink. Just washing up means we're watering three times a day without having to do anything. The kitchen sink waste comes out of the white pipe and goes into the tub. Gravity just takes the water down to the beds. I duplicated this system for the shower. When I first set up the self-irrigating planter, I just went to the supermarket and bought random selection of seedling plants. Well, I'm not a gardener, but they appear to have done very well.
I've got some offcuts of steel lying around. I've got enough space in the vegetable cage, so I'm going to turn this steel into a new planter. This enclosed cage gives us shade from the sun. It has a hose pipe to make watering easy. And we're getting stacks of food from the planters. We live in a cow paddock. I'm putting in a fence to keep the cows out. When they come walking round the containers, they tend to make a mess standing on the pipes and the cables. That's right, keep on walking. No tomatoes or broccoli or lettuce for you. You don't want to come out today, do you? Because you're being filmed. Having always lived in a rural area, going into suburbia was really a major crisis for me. I didn't like the energy there, there was not really a lot of nature to connect to. Everything was very materialistic. You couldn't even go for a walk because there were no paths. It was wonderful to actually come and live in the middle of the Australian bush because the connection with, with nature is absolutely wonderful. And it took a while for me and nature to connect because it's so wild and so unruly and so harsh. But the connection is there and it's wonderful. We have wildlife of abundance around us, possums and um, wallabies now absolutely have no fear of us and they just hop around feet away from us. It is lovely, it's lovely to have the peace and the quiet and not hear the traffic and not have your neighbours intruding on your life through noise. It's been an amazing experience just to spend so much time here on my own, in nature, with nature. Just having that connection to myself has been absolutely wonderful. I live very much in, in nature but I'm usually very busy. <laughs> There's so much to do when you live the lifestyle that we have. I have to keep the wood pile topped up, otherwise we go cold. Uh, I've done that once and I'm never doing that again. Keeping the dam cleared, it's, it's all time-consuming work. I even had to learn about backburning, which is clearing the bush so that fire doesn't come through. I thought it'd be nice if I could go swimming in the bush. When we lived in suburbia, I had an 8 metre swimming pool in the garden. After a year or two, the novelty of owning a swimming pool wore off. It takes a significant amount of effort, time, money and electricity to keep them looking good. I swim here now and there's no chlorine in the water. When I lived in suburbia, I was incredibly poor. I had this big house, I had the swimming pool, but I had no money to have any fun. There was nothing exciting because I was just paying the bills. And that's pretty soul-destroying. 
when you're having beans on toast so you can put petrol in the car to go to work. Come on then, let's go back. They're tired, look at him. He's tired. It's oh. just a very, very pleasant oh, lifestyle. A lifestyle that an awful lot of people would love to have and a lifestyle that people can have. If they really wanted it, they can do it. And you just have to feel the fear and jump anyway. You know, a lot of people don't want to let go of their lifestyle, of their jobs or their way of life and want to. People are in jobs they don't want to be in, they're in lifestyles they don't want to be in. But they don't need to be. You don't need to be chained to a system. You can step out of it. And I think a lot of people are doing that now. Well, I think the beauty of living in a shipping container is the fact that you can move them. They're, they're portable, so you can take them anywhere. Uh, living in a house, you can't move it. And if you're an adventurous type and you want to move around, the shipping containers are great because you can move them. The shipping containers They've had two locations up to now, and they could be moved again. I could unbolt the sunroof, the solar panels and the walkway, and they would be able to move again. This is one of the reasons that I've been keeping doors and windows to a practical minimum. When I started building the container house, I went online, and there was nothing. There were lots of pictures of fancy container houses that were finished, but nothing on how to actually do it. So I decided I'd record how I did it, and I post it online so other people can learn from my mistakes or copy it. Sarah was pushing me into the ebooks in the early phases because she said that I needed to share what I was doing. It took a little while for me to get on board with that, but once I did, I found I would get a lot of positive feedback from the information that I do share. Could anyone do this? There's been a lot of effort and it takes persistence. I'd say persistence is probably the key to it. It's been a huge amount of hard work. I did a terrible job with the putty, so Sarah redid it and it looked much better. You can't underestimate just how hard some it was at times, but it has been very rewarding. I really do believe that getting out of the system as much as you can being self-sufficient as much as you can. You don't have to do it 100%, but just as much as you can. You can have so much satisfaction. Now it's a finished self-contained house. It mm. provides its own electricity and water. It looks after us and it's a finished house. And it's great. It is actually. <laughs> it's, it's not just great, it's really, it's really great. good. It's 